it's always exciting. There's always something new. Um, you're meeting new people every day. I think it's so nice being on the floor and communicating and you're all really good friends and you're chatting all day. And I guess I just can't imagine sitting at a computer all day and being in an office and having cubicles and, and not talking. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Managing bookings during the last two years has been a huge headache for every establishment. No shows, nervous diners, restrictions, staff contracting COVID. The reasons are endless. How do you run a large restaurant, manage bookings and ensure viability through one of the toughest periods the industry has faced? Josephine Perry is a maitre d' of Margaret in Double Bay, Sydney. Josephine, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. You were forced to go into lockdown on the day that you were set to open the restaurant. What sort of impact did that have with so many advanced bookings? It was it was huge for us. You know, I mean, not only, I suppose, the impact of the bookings that we had to sort of deal with and cancel and, and all that kind of thing, but, you know, the anticipation and the excitement that was built around it and it being Neil's first venue. And, you know, it was just... we. It was so heartbreaking. Um, I just, you know, I just constantly felt like I was letting everyone down. You know, we were cancelling thousands and thousands of bookings um, that people had and they were so excited and they were long-term Neil fans and they were so excited for his first restaurant and then, you know, we, we get plunged into lockdown the day we were meant to open um, and it just felt like while you're trying to manage everything else going on that you're just constantly disappointing people and, you know, you're ruining Everyone was obviously very understanding, um, but you're ruining people's birthdays and anniversaries and there's already so much disappointment going on. Um, and you just, you know, you just, it's, it's, it was such hard work um, and you just felt like you were constantly disappointing everyone and it was a, ni- it was a nightmare, to be honest. <laughs> oh, it, I mean, that's extraordinary, the amount of bookings. I don't know the impact that it had on, on you all. How do you manage that scenario to ensure that a guest is is okay with it, but but also looking after your own self and the and the business too? So we basically sat down. I only had one other person helping me with reservations at that point in time. Um, so we basically sat down, just the two of us. Um, you know, because we were only we were only just about to open. No one really knew how to use the reservation system. Um, you know, it was all very new to all of us. Um, it was a brand new system that none of us had used before. Um, so there was only myself and my colleague Olivia that really knew how to actually get into the system and cancel bookings and, and, and retract those reports that we needed to get everyone's email address and phone numbers and things like that. So for the two of us, it was obviously a mammoth task. Um, so we basically had to go into the back end, download a report of everyone that had a booking and send out emails and try and call as many people as we possibly could. Um, and just explain the situation, how sorry we were, um, and that we would get back in touch with them, you know, when, you know, in a week, because at that point in time, we thought it was going to be a week, right? Like I remember being, my husband had, had put a knife through his hand and we were sitting in the hospital and we were waiting for someone to see us. And it was on the news, like, you know, we're going to get plunged into lockdown and we're going to go into lockdown. And we're thinking, oh, surely not. Um, you know, and we were actually, Mikey and I were actually sitting at the hand eye hospital in the city when they announced on with, with, with him having just put a knife through his hand. Um, and it came up on the news that we'd been, that we were going into lockdown for a week and we're just thinking, oh shit. Cause you know, the boys had just opened bistro as well. Um, and we were like, oh my, and we're like, you know what? It's just a week. Like we can get through this. Like it's a week, you know, and my colleague Olivia and I had been rescheduling people, for a week or two's time because we genuinely thought that it was only going to be a week, maybe maximum two weeks. Um, so we'd rebooked all these people in and then again, you've got to go back and say, look, it's not looking like we're actually going to be open. Um, is there another date that works for you guys? So, um, you know, it was a nightmare for us. Um, and also it, it, it is so depressing calling hundreds and hundreds of people and cancelling these bookings and, you know, you can't open the doors to this restaurant that you've been working so hard to get open and everyone's excited and you've hired a whole team of staff. Um, like logistically, it was just, it, it was just, it was a nightmare. 
that that lockdown ended up being four months. Um, tell us what that period of time was like. What, what happened with the team and, and what did you do to get through that four months? So we kind of all, we, we were obviously meant to open on the Friday. So there was a handful of us there already, mainly kitchen team and managers and things like that. And we just kind of all sat down and we decided that we weren't going to open on that Friday because it was, you know, you were going into lockdown at midnight or whatever. And we just didn't feel right about it anyway. And there'd been a few cases in Double Bay and I think everyone was a little bit nervous. So we just decided that we'd cancel all the bookings for that Friday night and and going forward. Um, and we just kind of all sat down and like, look, let's just, let's just stay in touch. You know, the most important thing right now is that everyone stays safe. Um, and that, you know, because I guess, you know, again, it's, looking back in the irony and things like that. I mean, now, you know, Omicron's ripped through the world and everyone's had it. But, you know, back then it was still in Sydney, especially I think, and, and Australia as a whole, it was still kind of that really unknown, like getting COVID was still really scary and people were still really unsure about it. And it was very kind of like, there was a little bit of a stigma around it, I suppose, at that point in time, you know, it was like, oh, if you got COVID, you know, people were really terrified about it back then. So it was like, let's just keep everyone safe. Um, that's the most important thing. You know, everyone go home, you know, two weeks time, we're going to be back, whatever it may be. Then when we realized that it was kind of going to be a little bit longer than I think we'd originally anticipated, um, we, you know, and, and I have to say like credit to dad, he was amazing, um, at really stepping up. Like we kept in contact with everyone. We had weekly emails going out to the staff. Dad was amazing at keeping in touch with all his friends in government and, um, you know, he was keeping everyone updated. We were getting weekly emails, um, keeping everyone updated on what was happening, the best way to get, you know, your government support, um, the things that you could do, um, you know, does anyone need anything? Like we were just really in touch with all of our staff constantly. Um, and we were doing Zooms and things like that. We were having like Zoom meetings and Zoom drinks on Fridays, Friday afternoons and things and like all catching up, just trying to keep, you know, keep close and keep that momentum going. Um, and then Providor came up. Um, so, you know, the guys from Melbourne who had started Providor, um, kind of started approaching people in Sydney. And I think, you know, dad just thought we can do this. Like, let's, let's do this. Let's all get back together. Let's do this takeaway thing. Let's try it. Let's see how it goes. Um, so we signed up to Providor and got, got involved in that. And then that's when things kind of started to, you know, like come together. We started thinking, well, why don't we do burgers? You know, why don't we do burgers on a Thursday and Friday? People can still drive to pick up takeaway food. Let's start doing burgers three days a week or, you know, whatever. And we can have two burgers on offer and we can do chips and we can like start, you know, selling some wine and some cocktails and things like that. And then it turned into like, well, why don't we do take home pies? And it just kind of, it just kind of escalated from there. And it was like, what else can we, you know, can we offer people and things like that? And I think that was really kind of like our saving grace. Now that I look back on it, it was such a painful period of time and we were all hating it. You know, it was so like packing boxes and it was something that we'd never done before. It was like packing boxes and dealing with shipping labels and dealing with customer service. And like, you know, I was having people call me on a Friday night, like my trifle's missing from my box and I live in the blue mountains. I was like, so it was like, it was so challenging, but I think the amazing thing was we managed to retain all of our staff that we'd started with. We, you know, everyone was getting paid, you know, and, and surviving and then getting their money from the government. So it was like everyone was still able to pay their rent and live their lives and, and do what they needed to do. It also gave us four months of like connecting as a team as well. So by the time we opened, it really felt like we actually were a family. We'd been like through the ringer together and you saw like through being in lockdown, you know, there were people that lived by themselves. There were people like there were so many different people from all different walks of life as part of our team. And they all went through the emotions and all went through the ups and the downs. And we were kind of all, it was like, you know, how are you? And it's like, I'm really down today. Or, and we kind of all started really becoming such close friends that by the time we actually did get the doors open in October, it felt like such a family. And we all knew who each other were and what ticked, you know, people off and, and, you know, what people's personalities were like and how to communicate with that person. And cause I think that's such a challenging thing in hospitality. There are so many personalities in, in one sort of sector or one area 
and you're not like in an office where you can avoid each other, you know, you've got to communicate 14 hours a day. So if you don't know who is, you know, who gets annoyed easily or who doesn't cope well under stress or whatever, it can be really challenging. Um, but at that point in time, we all knew each other so well that it was like when we opened, like Neil kept saying, you know, it's one of the best openings I've ever done in my career. It's been one of the easiest openings I've ever done in my career because we were all so close and we all knew each other so well and we had that extra time and we did the training and we put the work in and it really did make the reopening so much easier. So in hindsight, I guess we're kind of grateful for that period of time. Wow. <laughs> um, looking at the glass half full. <laughs> <laughs> well, given the sort of the drama and of, of cancelling all of those bookings when you were meant to open, what was the response in bookings like when you could reopen and the energy of in October? Everyone was really excited um, and it was half-half. You know, I think you're always going to get those people that are really excited and really happy and then you're always going to get those people that were booked in previously that couldn't then get the times that they wanted or whatever it may be and that were, like, that were difficult. Um, so, again, it was kind of challenging and there have been so many great people that have been really understanding and on the other opposite side of that there's been a lot of people that have been, you know, it, it has been challenging and difficult and we always do our best to accommodate and try and give them what they want and things like that but there's always going to be you know people that are unhappy so trying to manage that because also like bear in mind too that we had like the reservations for the rest of the year were open prior to this all happening so we had solid bookings probably up until about I'd say like April May this year so even trying to book people in like over the Christmas period and things like that and get people back in that had bookings in July and things like that, it was such a nightmare because that 6, 6.30, sort of 6.15 early time slot had been booked so far in advance that there was really limited, like we weren't working with very much. There was very limited space that we had to try and like get people back in. Um, so yeah, just trying to get all like you know, trying to reach out to as many people as we possibly could. And, you know, there were so many, like we were never going to be able to personally reach out to that many people. I think it was like 16,000 people or something that were on our database from that, from that period of time. So two people can't reach out to 16,000 people, um, and, and try and get them booked back in, you know? So we did our absolute best. I think we contacted everyone personally that had a booking for like the first month. And then we sent out like a big group email saying, you know, if you had a reservation for, um, you know, July, August or whatever, like, please, you know, get in touch with us and whatever. But as I say, at that point in time, we only, you know, we've, we've got one reservations person. I've literally had a second one start today. Um, so all this time there's only been myself and one other reservations and events person. So, um, it's been huge for us. <laughs> you grew up in a family where, um, you know, your father is one of the most influential, um, food identities in Australia's history. What was it like for you as a child in that environment? Um, it was definitely like, I think I, you know, I had such a unique, um, and like amazing upbringing. Um, it was definitely unique. You know, I think like I didn't really, I, I don't think I really started to realize, I guess, his influence in, until I was a little bit older. And so when he started to sort of, you know, do TV and he had his products in Woolworths and all that kind of stuff, I think was when I started to sort of really, I guess, realize his influence and things like that. But, um, you know, it was an amazing, it, it was an amazing upbringing. Like I remember being so little and just like running around the restaurants and like I just I was so like I used to I used to absolutely torture them um like I remember being really little and because my my parents separated when I was quite young so dad obviously had rock pool and you know I lived mainly with my mum but I used to go and spend every Thursdays and every second weekends with dad um and there was this amazing beautiful waitress called Vicky that used to work at rock pool and I just absolutely fell in love with her and she ended up becoming my nanny so on Thursdays she used to come and pick me up from school and I even remember like when I met her at rock pool and I just I probably was about three three and a half and I just loved her so much and her dad was this crazy 
crazy um, doctor, like amazing doctor in the States. And she, she used to bring back all these really cool Band-Aids and things with all these different like amazing, um, you know, US characters and things on that you couldn't get in Sydney. And I remember her telling me one day that one of the other waitresses was being mean to her. And I, I honestly wouldn't have even been four years old at that point in time. And I remember walking up to this waitress and being like, if you keep being mean to my Vicky, like I'm going to have my dad fire you. You know, like I was just so bossy and so like I just felt so confident and I just felt so good when I walked in the restaurants and I was like, you know, this is my place and blah, blah, blah. And she ended up becoming my nanny. So she used to come and pick me up from school on Thursday afternoons and take me into Rockpool to see dad. Um, and I just used to tear around the restaurant and all the young chefs that were working at Rockpool when I was little, like Simon Zalua. Um, and like Jules, who's at Butter now, um, and Graham Hunt and uh, Nathan Sassy and all those guys. And I just used to go in and just absolutely torture them and um, run around. And But it was amazing because I think something that I, that I took away from it or something that I learned from it, I suppose at such a young age, was to have adult conversations. Like I was talking to adults constantly. Um, so I was in the restaurant talking to all the guys, talking to all the adults. So I learned to kind of hold a conversation and, and we didn't have, you know, iPhones and things back then either. So you couldn't like sit your kid at the counter with an iPad and keep them entertained. You had to, you had to kind of entertain yourself. So, um, I just remember running around and folding napkins and hanging out with dad. And I just, I loved it from such an early age. I just loved going into the restaurants and I thought all the guys that worked there were so cool. Um, and, you know, it was just so fun and I just, I just loved it. Like, I think I just fell in love with it from such a young age. Was a career in hospitality always something that you envisaged or did you, did you have other plans or? I didn't really have other plans, to be honest. I kind of, when I grew up and I was at school and things like that, I never really enjoyed school and I was never really that focused or disciplined and I never really particularly, I know this sounds terrible, I never particularly had anything that I was interested in. Um, I used to horse ride and that was kind of like my main hobby growing up. And I always thought that it would be very cool to be a mounted policewoman. But I just, apart from that, I never really had kind of anything in mind. Like I, I never really envisaged going to uni. I never really knew what I wanted to study. I never really had like a career in mind or a goal or anything like that, that I was kind of trying to achieve. Um, and then when I was 14, dad opened Spice Temple in Sydney um, cause Rockpool Bar and Grill was being built and it, it was still in construction. And I remember him saying like, do you want to come and help out on the opening night? Um, and I was like, oh sure, you know, whatever. And like Barchi Moore was the GM at the time and I'd grown up around her and Pete as well. So I felt really comfortable with her. So I went and started working at Spice Temple. Um, and I just loved it. I just enjoyed it so much and I was doing really crappy jobs. I was like food running and polishing cutlery and like, I, you know, I wasn't like doing anything particularly fun, but I just loved being in that environment and the fast pace, you know, it was just so fast paced and it was like no day was the same. Like every day was different. It was like you're meeting new people all the time. It was just so exciting. Um, and I think kind of at that point in time, I kind of realized that I probably wanted to, to work in hospitality at least for a few years and like see, you know, maybe what else if I wanted to do something when I was like 18, 19 or whatever. Anyway, when I got to like 16 and a half, I ended up leaving school um, and I started working at Spice Temple full time and I've just been doing it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> You've, um, you've, you've worked with your father in many different establishments. What's been the real sort of key pivotal sort of establishments and moments that have sort of elevated your career during that time? I think definitely my start at Spice Temple, I have to say, had a huge impact. As I said, Barchi Moore was the general manager at the time and I was working with Christian Denyer as well. He was the assistant restaurant manager. And I think because I'd known Barchi for such a long time and I'd known her since I was such a small child, um, you know, she felt really comfortable and she wasn't afraid to tell me off or give me advice or pull me up on things that I was doing wrong. You know, I think that was, that was so important because I was so young and I was so impressionable and it really could have gone either way. And she really was very strict with me. And I think a lot of people sort of 
you know, going through the motions with dad over all these years and, and growing up in it and things like that. There have been so many restaurant managers and general managers and things that haven't pulled me up or wanted to tell me things or, you know, because they're, I guess they're afraid or they're worried that they're going to offend me or they're like, I don't want to, you know, deal with her going and telling Neil or whatever it may be. Um, and so Barchi was really, she was really amazing and she pulled me up on so many things and she really taught me and, 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 you know, she was so graceful on the floor and she still is, she's really amazing. Um, and so I think she really greatly influenced me. Um, and I would have to say another one's Jeremy Comadius, who I worked with at Rockpool Bar and Grill in Sydney. Um, so he was the GM at Rockpool and for years and years, and he was another one too, that really, um, pulled me up and held me accountable and was like, that's not cool. You know, don't do that. And, and, um, you know, he was just so professional and someone that I really admired as well. Um, he just never skipped a beat, Jeremy. Like, he's just, he's amazing. Like, I, I don't know how he does it. He's so incredible. He's literally, literally never has an off day. He's always on. He's just, he's amazing. Um, so he really influenced me too. I remember actually being, I think I was probably about 16. 17 and I was working at Rockpool Bar and Grill in the in the wine bar and I'd gone out the night before uh, with one of our regulars at Rockpool and I'd gotten really drunk and I got on the train in the morning I was so hungover and I got on the train to go to work and I felt so unwell and I was like oh my god I can't do this and I got off the train at Martin Place it was literally peak hour threw up on the escalator on my way up to the main train station, I turned up to work. I was literally green. Everyone was like, you look terrible. And I was so sick and I was throwing up out the back um, in the rubbish bins. I kept having to change the bin liners. I was just having the worst day. I was miserable. And Jeremy, I, I went, it was like after lunch service, I think, and I went into the cool room and I just like crouched down on the floor in the cool room and I was like crying. And JC opened the door and was like, get up. And I was like, oh, my God. And he was like, you've got two options. He was like, you can go home and I'm going to give you a written warning because this is just like unacceptable or you can stay here and finish out your shift for the rest of the night. And I was like, okay. Anyway, so I ended up staying and I worked the whole shift and, of course, they made me close. So I was there until after midnight um, and I was so sick but I just remember – you know, at 16 and a half or 17 or whatever, being like, you've, you've just got to show up and you've got to get the job done. You know, you've got to be professional. And, and I was so grateful that he pulled me up on that and didn't just sort of go, Oh, you know, you can go home, you poor thing. Cause you don't learn your lesson from that. Right. So, um, so yeah, I'd probably have to say the two, the two Sydney, the Spice Temple Sydney and the Rockpool Bar and Grill Sydney probably had the two biggest influences on me from dad's kind of, from dad's restaurants. There was a period of time as well when you opened your own restaurant uh, in Potts Point, Missy French. What, what did you get out of that experience? Were there challenges and benefits of, of, of rolling the dice like that with your own venue? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I did learn a lot from that experience. Um, I was so young. I was 21 when Missy French opened. And, yeah, and looking back on that period of time, I probably was way too young <laughs> to be – to be opening up my own restaurant. Um, but, you know, I gave it a go and I did learn so much about managing staff and, um, you know, managing your own business and, and all that kind of stuff and I guess the business side of things as well. Um, and I did, I you know, I learned some really, really valuable, um, valuable lessons from that experience going into it with two silent partners as well. Um, you know, there are so many things that I guess I would do differently now that I'm kind of turning 28 and I, I reflect back on that time and, and what I do to look after myself. Um, in that kind of position, I was just so young. I didn't really know what I was doing. So you just sort of sign whatever and say yes to whatever because, you know, you think you're being looked after. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was an amazing experience and it was such a beautiful little restaurant and I was really proud of what we did manage to achieve there. And, um, you know, my chef Chris was amazing too and, and you know, I think we'll be friends for forever. And it was kind of, you know, that experience, it, it was amazing. Um, and I'm really glad that I've had it because now I know that if I do open my own venue down the track, there are so many things that I would, that I would do differently. Um, so yeah, really valuable experience, really good to have it out of the way and to get it done so young, I think too. Um, you know, like dad was saying to me, like, you know, you tried it, you know, how amazing to have that experience so young, um, and to, and to go through that at such a young age and then come out the other side of it and then still have the rest of your life to, you know, I, I guess, you know, 
amazing that it did happen. And I guess being older in life, it's always harder to start a business and fail, right? Um, so, yeah, I guess lucky that I had that experience so young and I've learned a lot from it and I do things a million times differently <laughs> over. <laughs> Most restaurants are family-run businesses. Um, well, what's the relationship been like with you and, and Neil, um, both at work and away from work? Is it, is it challenging um, in, in your role? Um, I, we've actually been really lucky. Like I have to say, um, we have always had a really close relationship, um, w- which we've been very fortunate for. Um, as I said, my parents separated when I was quite young. So that can always be, um, you know, a challenging, a challenging time. And dad remarried when I was quite young as well. So I think of all the kind of adversity that I guess we've faced through all these things, we've always remained very, very close. Um, and we've been close my whole life. Um, and We've been so lucky. I mean, we've never really had like a big fight. We've never really had like a big blowout. We've never really had anything affect us in a way that it's affected us either personally or professionally. And we still really enjoy spending time together as a family as well. I mean, you know, I see him 60 hours a week, but um, we still really enjoy going out for a family dinner on Monday or, you know, seeing each other on our days off. And um, we're very lucky in that respect. I think we're quite similar. Dad and I have very similar personalities um, we're pretty chilled. We don't really let, let a lot get to us. You, you've been involved in so many restaurants with Neil, but Margaret is something a bit different. Um, tell us about how it feels. Is it, does it feel like a different restaurant compared to others that, that Neil and you have been involved in? Um, yeah, it definitely does feel different um, to, to restaurants that dad has owned in the past. Um, you know, obviously dad owning it hundred percent solely himself. Um, so it really feels like it's ours, um, being named after my beautiful late grandmother, uh, Margaret, who I was very, very close to. So that's really special. Um, and being in a neighborhood as well, you know, for us being in double Bay and being in a neighborhood and being in this environment, it just, it does feel different to having a restaurant right in the middle of the CBD. Um, it's a different clientele. Uh, it's a different vibe and, um, I, I'm really loving it. It feels, you know, it feels a lot more like home, I think, than, than they have in the past. What's the challenges at the moment? Uh, there's been, you know, a lot of staff getting COVID and managing bookings and, and things like that. Well, how does it feel in, in the restaurant at the moment? And are you optimistic about the year ahead? I am optimistic about the year ahead. I think it's, I think it's sort of like finally starting to feel like it's actually all coming together. Um, Christmas and New Year was just horrendous and sort of, you know, leading up to Christmas. Um, we did have a lot of staff sick with COVID. Uh, we had a lot of guest cancellations um, and then, you know, trying to manage that and getting people in and where you can and people being nervous and wanting to sit outside and, and sort of trying to manage that from our bookings perspective. Um, you know, I, I got sick, I got COVID, dad got COVID, our executive chef Richard got COVID, our head sommelier Richard Healy got COVID um, all in the same week. So that was really hard for all of us to let go, I think. Um and yeah, I mean, from Christmas and New Year, I think was just absolutely dreadful. Now I think sort of midway through February, it is actually starting to feel like we are coming back. Um, bookings are really strong. It's super busy. We're getting way less cancellations. We seem to be getting some new faces through the door staff wise. Um, so I am feeling really optimistic for the rest of the year. You know, I think Hopefully, I mean, we've all said this before, right, that we've, that we've gone through it and this is it. Um, and I'm sure there'll be another variant or something and we're going to just be dealing with this for the rest of our lives. Um, but for the moment, I am optimistic. I said that I was going into 2022 with the glass half full. Um, so I'm trying to stay positive and I think we're coming back. I, I'm, you know, I'm noticing restaurants are busier. Um, we're really busy. You know, I try to go out for dinner on Mondays and Tuesdays. Places are sort of slowly starting to open back up again. Um, so I am, I am feeling optimistic about this year, and I, I'm feeling good. I'm hoping that we're, we're through the shitstorm because I think we've all been through enough. <laughs> like, enough's enough. <laughs> You've had the unique uh, life of being in and around restaurants for your entire life, um, well, and now you build an incredible career in the hospitality sector. What, what do you love about what you do? Um, oh my gosh, there's so many things. Um, I love, you know, obviously, I love first and foremost. I love food and wine, and I love hospitality, and I love drinks, and I love like 
feeding people and nurturing people and and all that kind of stuff. And I love going out to restaurants and enjoying food and wine myself and things like that. So um, that's something that's really special to me. I love restaurants. I love dining in them. I love the whole thing. Um, you know, I guess working in one – it just goes back to what I was saying before about just no, no two days are the same. Um, you know, it's always exciting. There's always something new. Um, you're meeting new people every day. Um, you're in such a close team environment as well, which I really enjoy because I think it's so nice being on the floor and communicating and you're all really good friends and you're chatting all day. And, you know, I think, I guess I just can't imagine sitting at a computer all day and being in an office and having cubicles and, and not talking. And, you know, I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. I love hearing people's stories. And, um, you know, I love, I love just people coming into the restaurant and, and being blown away and having such a great time and eating something they've never eaten before or trying a glass of wine they've never tried before or, um, you know, I just, I, I just, lo I just love it. Like, I just, I love it so much. Um, it's such an amazing industry. And then, you know, seeing other people do really well too, because obviously, you know, I mean, you know what it's like, it's such a small industry. Everyone knows everyone, right? So I think as well, seeing what other people are doing and going to their restaurants and, and watching all these other people do really amazing things with food and wine and produce. And, you know, it's just, it's so amazing. Um, and like even, you know, recently we've, we're very produce driven at Margaret um, and we were, we're working with all these really amazing um, fish and meat and, you know, vegetable suppliers and things like that. And getting to meet these guys and, and talking to them and like Wentworth who grows our beautiful potatoes, like these people are so fascinating and you'd just never, you'd never meet them. You know, you'd never, it's just, their stories are incredible. Um, I think everyone's passion who's in the industry as well. Um, you know, everyone's so passionate about it because it's hard. Like you wouldn't do it unless you loved it. <laughs> you'd be crazy. Um, well, we'd loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to just hear a bit of your story, Josephine. Um, please keep in touch and we'll definitely have to catch up again soon. Sounds good. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.